God wants the heart. Turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We read verses 1 to 6 back on May the 8th, you may recall. We, uh, we looked at this at the time, this powerful beauty of uh, biblical womanhood, shifting the emphasis today. I told you back then, May 8th, you've had a month and a half to read over this verse, guys, and know that this was where we were going to camp this morning. 1 Peter 3, 7, don't be deceived by the brevity of the verse, the fact that Peter speaks six verses to the women. You, you will understand that when you see what he says to the men about how they're to relate to their wives. You may ask yourself, well, why are you preaching on the powerful force of biblical manhood relative to a text that talks about being a husband rather than preaching about fathers? Well, the truth of the matter is, if you're not this kind of husband to your wife, you won't be worth a flip as a father to your children. Their first experience of feeling love typically comes from their mom when they're delivered from the womb or when they come into their arms. They, they experience feeling love by their dads, but they see, they observe love as they watch their dads love their moms. First Peter 3, 7. Stand with me. I want to read this text. We have it on the screen in case you don't have your Bible, but I would much rather you have your own copy of the Scriptures. And if you don't have a copy of the Scriptures, please see me. We'll get one in your hands, I promise. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. We have just read together what? Inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May the Lord raise up a generation of men. May the young men moving into manhood make this their mantle, their commitment. And let's see this generation rescued from its complete and utter chaos and confusion. Thank you. Please be seated. Peter has spoken to wives in a very difficult situation. You have to know that in the first century and in many places in the world today, I mean, you know, one, one of the marks you've got that, that is common, it's universal in the Muslim world today is that women are treated very, very little different than the household pets. Peter writes to women in the first century who were not treated well either. In fact, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that elevates woman to the status of equal human being. And he wrote to them in these first six verses that we studied back in May. Now he turns his focus to the husbands. And you understand the way he's, the, the language, likewise. In other words, he says in the, in the same way, Husbands have to have a submissive attitude. If you study Ephesians chapter 5, where the, the passage leading into the section on the relationship, the role of the husband, the role of the wife, the, how, how it reflects the, the preciousness and beauty of Christ in the church, you know from that passage, Peter leads into it, talking about being filled with the Spirit. Stop continuing to be drunk with wine, he says, but keep on being filled with the Spirit. And then he talks about what that looks like. He never discusses how to be filled with the Spirit. He simply talks about what being filled with the Spirit looks like. And one of the things he says it looks like is submitting to one another. He's speaking of the body of Christ, the, the church at Ephesus, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then, of course, we know that he goes on and talks about wives submitting to their husbands. But I pointed out to you when we went through the study in Ephesians several years ago, that the, that the word submit is not in the text there. That doesn't mean a wife is not to submit. What it means is you understand that from the context. Submitting to one another out of, the, out of reverence for Christ. Wives unto your husbands as unto the Lord. What unto your husbands? Submit unto your husbands. So Peter here, likewise, the husband is to take a, a submissive posture. He is, he is submissive under the lordship of Christ. A man who is not submitted to the lordship of Christ is not worth a plug nickel as a husband. The 
because if he's not submitted to the Lordship of Christ, he will not care what Christ says. He will not be influenced by the Spirit of God to, to, to lead as Christ says, to reflect the, the, the attitude of Jesus Christ in his relationship to his wife and his children. So Peter says likewise. Now, now what I want to do in just a few minutes here today is look at this text and then and then we're going to look at the, the text that follows it, which really kind of becomes a summary for Peter to these relationship discussions he's had in this portion of his letter. First, we want to look at the, this two-pronged command to men. The command comes in the form of a participle. And then secondly, a two-fold reason for the command. First of all, the, the two-pronged command to men. Likewise, husbands, live with, and there's the first prong of it, your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. There's the second prong, showing honor. We will live considerately with our wives. When we are harsh with our wives, we are we are showing we, we're not only not reflecting Jesus Christ, we are reflecting Antichrist. It's the Christ. So husbands, live with your wives. I tell people when I when I'm doing premarital counseling, I tell the prospective uh, groom, you are uh, entering into and then fill in the blank of the bride-to-be, her name 101. You're entering into 101. 42 years ago, I entered into this course called Karen 101. Where are you now? Well, I've had to retake it several times, and uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning. Parenthetically, those of you guys who've been married long enough, do you do you recognize that your wives change? They change. They go through life cycle changes. I change too, full disclosure. But but so the notion that uh, we've discovered through the years, Karen, and I have that that I'm scratching her where she's not itching. She was itching there at one time, and I thought I was doing a good job of scratching that, but she's not itching there. Now she needs to be scratched somewhere else. And, and you, so you've got to stay alert. You've got to stay alert. Live with them in an understanding way. It's interesting, this, this term living with <clears throat> is found only here in the New Testament. Now if you look at the, the Greek version of the Old Testament, talked to you about that before, the, the Septuagint, where the guys were, were the, tr the Greek translators were forced to make equivocation of Greek words and ideas with, with Hebrew statements. It, it comes up several times. <clears throat> Many times it has the, uh, the overtones of the marriage bed uh, to be understanding, to be sensitive, but it, but it carries the whole force of the entire relationship. If you read Deuteronomy 22, uh, 13 and following, for example, it's, it begins this way. If any man takes a wife and goes into her, there you see the, the marriage bed in case, and then hates her or acts hateful toward her. And it, it goes down and he, he falsely accuses the woman in this particular instance. And, and the father of the woman steps up and defends her, her dignity, uh, her chastity and, and all. And then they, they kind of go to a, to a trial of sorts. And the man is found out to have to have falsely accused her. He is whipped. There's physical punishment dealt out to him. Because he's not living with her in an understanding way. He's not showing regard to her. The, the second prong of this, as I said, uh, is to do so showing honor to her. Now this is, this is interesting because some men think that all the honor flowing in the house is supposed to come to them. You know. I'm the guy here. All that comes to me. Well, that's, that's an interesting idea and it, you find it in the world somewhere, you know, within, in some, uh, some, uh, some macho machismo mentality. But it's, the scripture talks about that there's a, there's a mutual honor shown. A wife honors her husband by showing respect to him. We looked at we looked at that recently. Being respectable. 
a, a husband shows honor to his wife by loving her, by, by caring for her. And so you do this. In fact, Paul, if you look at the, one of the other versions, dwell with your wife according to knowledge. Uh, when he says live with your wife in an understanding way, the idea of understanding is, is knowing her, get to know your wife. And, and Paul uses this term several ways in the New Testament, but, but, but here he's using it as this personal insight that leads to loving and considerate care of a man toward his wife. Remember now, you, you practice this early on in the relationship. You ought to get good at it early on in the relationship so that when the Lord does give children by whatever means, whether through, whether through uh, procreation or whether through adoption, that, that you have been practicing this so that the children get to see this in play. Personal insight that leads to loving and considerate care. He, he's I'll show you how he uses this, this kind of idea of knowledge. It's Philippians 1 9, he says, It's my prayer, writing to the church at Philippi, it's my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Is he simply saying, Now, I want you to, when I come, I want you to be able to, to tell me the name of everybody that's part of the Philippian congregation? No. That knowledge is, is that, 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 that personal insight, that, that loving, considerate care. He wants, I want the Philippians to be that kind of a congregation. Apparently they were because he highly commends them for this. More and more, he says. Colossians 1, 9 and 10, same, same use. And so from the day we heard, we've not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. It, you see, it, folks, it does no good to know about the will of God if there's not that personal engagement and, and, and determination to do the will of God. The Pharisees knew, and Paul said when he prayed for those type of guys, he called them his, his Hebrew brothers, for, for they, they, have a, uh, they have a zeal for God, but they don't have a knowledge of the truth. They, they, another place that they're, they're always learning but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. He goes on and says that, to, with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk see there there's the connection so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord fully pleasing him bearing fruit in every good work increasing in the knowledge of God and that that personal relationship that you have with the Lord one more time uh, Colossians chapter 3 he says you've put on the new self which is being renewed in the knowledge in knowledge after the image of the creator it's being renewed in that it's a personal considerate engaging And he says that we're to show honor uh, to the because they're the more vulnerable sex. Now, men, when we look at the society around us, we look at all the ills, and let's let's go back a ways. Let's go back to the '60s, to the to the feminist movement, the, the rise of radical feminism. So how does that happen? It happens when the men in the church of Jesus Christ do not conduct themselves as men. Two things happen. The preachers stop preaching the gospel and stop preaching the truth and, and drawing the line and saying, this pleases God, this, this dishonors God. And when, when the men stop functioning in their homes, and when that happens, Girls grow up who don't want to be, have anything to do with a man. And the devil comes along and starts a movement. Where women think that they don't need men. And it, it morphs and it evolves to what we have today where people, we, we, I'm not going to preach this again, but the whole gender identity thing, guys, you've got to understand this. It comes to two places. It stops, it comes to this pulpit and it drops right here or any pulpit that is refused to preach the truth as it is in Jesus and God's word and God's will and God's way. And it comes to men who refuse to love and live in their homes as the Lord has called us to love and live. So, as one writer said, I, I think it was one of the Tripp brothers, said if we were as... Uh, worked up about our own 
internal remaining sin as we are the external sins of the generation. The body of Christ will be very different. The gospel of Christ will be very advanced. But because it's easier to get all worked up about all the social ills around us than it is to get worked up about what, what am I doing to stem the tide in the, in the little piece of earth that God has given me. And so we're to show them honor. They are honorable. God has made male and female different. And an interesting thing happened recently. And I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to run down this rabbit trail, but I'm going to take you a snapshot. I think it was in the state of Alaska where a, where a boy who identifies as a girl to say that even, just so bizarre, but, and was allowed to participate in girls' track. Guess who won? I mean, how wimpy would you have to be as a boy to get beat by a girl in girls' track? For crying out loud. He won. And, so, and they're, all, they're all just... We're made different. It doesn't mean that women are inferior. In fact, I've said to you from this pulpit before, don't think that this text teaches women are, are, are weaker in terms of inferior. I thank God that in His providence, women are the ones who have the babies. I've talked to men who've had kidney stones. Now, baby, kidney stone, No, it's not that at all. But that God has made us biologically different for, for biologically different challenges and roles and responsibilities. And so we are as men to, to honor them. No matter how tough you think a woman may be, she is a woman made by God. Never forget that. Treat her in such a way. He gives this twofold uh, reason for this command. So live with them in an understanding way. Honor them. Show them honor. Josh said he, this, this verse smacked him in the face this week. He was reading and he goes, wait, I'm not showing honor to my wife. Well, the good news is he followed the gospel path. You repent and then you, then you show fruit of repentance. Isn't that good news for all of us guys? It's not fatal if we repent and show fruit of repentance and we'll be forgiven because I think a woman, every woman I know who has a husband who's following the Lord longs to, to, to is willing to forgive him when he repents and longs to have him lead. And it's, it's woven into her when Christ saves her. I think it's woven into her uh, just by her, by her very makeup. But when Christ saves her, it's, it blossoms. There's two four reasons. First, they are heirs with you of the grace of life. So when, you, when, you, when you're not living in an understanding way, wanting to understand so that you can better minister to and disciple your wife and lead her, and pray over her, when you're not doing that, you're treating her very much spiritually in the way that women were treated in the centuries leading up to the gospel breaking on the scene when they were treated like second class citizens. She's a joint heir of grace. She's a sister in Christ. We should never treat our own wives in such a way that it could be said that we treat, we show women in the church more honor, more respect than we show our own wives. That's, that's, there's, there's consequences for that, guys, and Peter's leading up to that. Since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, the same blood of Jesus Christ that saved you is the blood of Jesus Christ that saved them, and you need to recognize that and do not treat her as less than that. Blood was shed for her. The same grace of God it took to save you is the grace of God shown to her that saved her. And then the second reason here, so that your prayers may not be hindered. What are you talking about there? 
Praying is simply going through the motions. And it's, it's not just the fact of praying. Praying as, a, as, a, as an emblem and a, a symbol of worship. One of the accusations leveled at the people of God by God through Isaiah the prophet was, these people worship me with their lips. And you pray, you, but their hearts are far from me. God, God asked in another, another place, do I, do I accept your sacrifice? Does your sacrifice please you? No, I despise your sacrifice. You see, Jesus made it clear to the woman at the well that God is seeking worshipers who will worship him in spirit and in truth. He's looking at the heart. Isaiah closes out his, his, his great mammoth uh, prophecy in the last chapter, the 66th chapter, with God speaking, saying, This is the man I'm searching to and fro on earth, and this is the man I'm looking for. A man who has a contrite heart, who has a, has a tender heart that's able to be, to be broken over his sin who has a contrite heart and who trembles at my word a man who reads the word and trembles oh dear God please please help me by your grace to be the man of God in the most in the most vital mission field you have given me and that is my home that your prayers not be hindered that your worship not be hollow and empty that you not imagine that you can go through the motions. I've told you about my dad. Heard a story about my dad this week from my, from my aunt who's dying that really really encouraged me about, about certain aspects of him. But, but my dad would uh, come to church, pray, participate in taking up the offering, taught a Sunday school class. He, people love to hear my dad pray, but... He took God's name altogether differently at home. He treated my mother awfully, horribly. So much so that women from the church would come to her and say, you need to leave him. You don't, you don't need this. What a hypocrite. What a hypocrite. Peter's saying, don't hypocrite yourself. Don't be one thing, appear to be one thing in public as a Christian man and be, be all but a devil at home. It's one verse. He gave six of the women and you'd like to think, well, it's six times. Well, no, you, you can't multiply it out like that. This verse is staggering. Now, why is that so critical? Why this teaching? Well, just real quickly, Jesus taught the principle of Matthew 5.23 if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you substitute brother for wife there remember that your wife has something against you that you've been harsh to her you have uh, uh, you know the, 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 the joke that's not funny about the family that pulls up to worship and they've been fighting all the way from the house to, to the church house and then they get out and well good morning yeah they, you know that Jesus taught in the model prayer, the, the disciples' prayer, chapter 6, verse 12, forgive us our debts as we ha also have forgiven our debtors as we, as we keep the slate clean between us and our spouse. And yes, the wife ought to do it too, but I'm going to tell you something, guys, the scripture is very plain. When God, when God comes into the garden in Eden, if there's any doubt about this, he comes to the garden in Eden. Eve is the one who sinned first. Adam's sin was standing by her, not intervening and saying, no, she's not going to eat that. Put that away. She gave to her husband who was there with her. All right. And God comes into the garden, though. What does he say? Adam, where are you? Yes, the wife must forgive. But the people that lead the way in the home are the guys the men verse 14 and 15 of chapter 6 for if you forgive others their trespasses your heavenly father will also forgive you but if you do not forgive others their trespasses neither will your father forgive your trespasses the principle is very plain that, that real forgiveness comes from God to people who have a forgiving spirit not because their spirit is forgiving their forgiving spirit is evidence that they have a forgiving relationship with the Lord a merciful relationship with the Lord 
And then James says in chapter 4, verse 3, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. However, those passions manifest themselves. Whether it's a passion to be harsh to your wife, it's a passion to pursue other things more than you pursue the care and nurture of your wife. Doesn't matter. You ask and do not receive. Your prayers are hindered because you, you want to spend it on your passions, not, not on that which God's passionate about. So, you would think, well, that's the end of it. That's, that's a challenge. That's painful enough. Well, that's why, that's why a song like, Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. I've got to, I need to be reminded by your Spirit that you're my righteousness, my, my, my measure, my, my, my labor, my scorecard as a husband is not, is not to measure my righteousness. Jesus Christ is my righteousness. Lord, I need you. Because, see, Peter goes on. In verses 8 through 12. I'm just going to read these. Just, just hear these in the context. Finally. Now having att addressed these. How, how slaves were to act toward their masters and wives. Toward their husbands and husbands toward their wives. Finally. All of you. Have unity of mind. In other words think on these things. Agree on these things. Sympathy. The word symp sympatheo. To Feel with these things, men. You know, we're, we're made differently. We're not made so differently that we don't, we don't feel with. We're, Jesus is a sympathetic Savior. With sympathy, brotherly love. In the application of the context here, why, men, Give a Philadelphia love to your, to your wife. Love her as a, as a fellow heir. Brotherly love is between believers. With a tender heart. Not a hard heart. And a humble mind. Not, a, not an arrogant mind. Not lording it over. Do not repay evil for evil. Do not revile as a response to reviling. But contrary... Bless. We've shown evil. What do we do? We bless. You've seen the bumper sticker. God, help us if it's ever on a, a real Christian's car. I don't get mad. I get even. No. Rip that off. Someone shows me evil. I bless. Someone who reviles against me. I bless. This is what you were called to. That you may obtain a blessing. See, when we fail to function this way, then the blessing is lost to us. For whoever, and he's quoting Psalm 34 here, Verses 12 to 16. Whoever desires to love life and see good days. This, this is almost, this is the parental counterpart to the fifth commandment, which says, Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God gives you. Spoken to children. This is spoken to, to, to adult believers. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and, and practice good. Let him seek peace and then pursue, pursue the seeking of peace. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. Do you think Peter's deviated from what he was saying in verse 7? His eyes are on the righteous. They're open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Psalm 1, the wicked are not so. They will not prosper. They will not stand in the day of judgment. You see, it's all contextually considered by Peter. Ladies, we thank God for you that you, that you love us and put up with us. And, and brothers... Your husbands, your fathers, your grandfathers, some of you, great grandfathers. And you are a powerful force for good. Now, you're a powerful force either way it goes. I was rescued by God's grace from a powerful force for evil, for darkness. But you can be a powerful force for good, for righteousness, and for truth in your home. You can be a powerful force for good in this church. You see, the devil will see to it that if, if Christianity is not being hammered out at home, it'll be a farce here. Your effectiveness will be blunted. 
We can be a powerful force for truth in the world. We, we are losing our way as a culture to even know what it means to be male. We need godly men, biblical manhood to rise up and say, this, not, this is what it is. If you read my article in the Russell Reporter, the, the, the owner, the owner has written an owner's manual. We're not confused about this, about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman. It's clear in here. But it's got to start in the first institution ordained by God before there was what we would call a society, a political society, there was a home. And before there was something known as a church, there was a home. It is, the, it is the breeding ground. It is the training ground. It is where the gospel is first shown. You see, man, this is what it comes down to for us. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. Will the children grow up having seen the gospel in action so that when they hear it from your lips that Jesus Christ loved the church and gave Himself for her. When they hear that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, they'll be able to say, you know, my dad, imperfectly for sure, but my dad labored and would strive, spend his energies to show to me something of the love of Christ for His church in the way that He loved my mom. Or will they grow up with a complete disconnect that marriage has anything to do with gospel proclamation? See, that's the choice you make. You make that choice. Whether the gospel will be woven into the fabric of your home or whether it will be something set apart, something totally different from your home. That's why Peter takes this one power-packed verse, giving two pronged commands, two reasons that she, my prayer is that your wife, whatever she feels, however long you've been married, whether you just got married yesterday, whether you've been married 50-something years, heading into 60 years, that she will feel and know that she is valued because she has a husband who loves Christ. And He wants to show that in the way that He loves her. My prayer is that your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren will be able to say, you know, I heard the Gospel of the love of Christ. And by the mercy of God, I saw it fleshed out in my home and the love my dad had for my mom and, and the love and respect she showed to him. And I saw it. And I heard it. That's my prayer. It's my prayer for myself, my prayer for my children, my prayer for you, for your children. Because, folks, we, the, the battle is pitched against us because we as men did not fight the battle with the Lord's tools that He gave us. It's not too late. It's not too late. We can rise. I believe, I believe a small pocket of men can rise and say, under God, with His help, I will be that man. And when a group of men join together and say that together, that God will look upon that and say, there's a guy, there's a group of men who have contrite hearts because they've, they recognize where they've not been that. And they repent and I forgive them. And there's a group of men who take my word and who tremble at my word. I believe God will do business with a church made up of men who mean business with Him on this matter. How do I do that, preacher? Only by grace. Only by grace. Repenting where you discover your sin. Being forgiven knowing that Christ shed His blood 
also for that. Being brought back to the cross every day of your life. Never stray far from it. It is our banner. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, I, I'm grateful that you are a father. To the fatherless, you're a father. You're, you're our God and our Father. You have given us Jesus Christ, your precious Son, and He has shown us. Though He, he was never married in the way that we talk about being married, He married Himself to His church. And we who are recipients of that grace, we who are members of His church, know and experience the love of Christ. And oh God, in this day when, when manhood is so misunderstood, when, when, when the ditch of, it, of, of an effeminate man and the ditch of a bully, the opposite ditches both, both cause the same destruction. Oh God, help us to walk the path of biblical manhood. I pray for these men here. I thank you for the men who model this. I do. I thank you. May their number increase. And I pray that you will raise up here a company of men, a band of brothers who will purpose under God with the help of your Spirit and the encouragement of one another to be such men to our wives and to speak this into the hearts of our sons that they too may grow to be such men by your grace and speak it and model it for our daughters that they may see what it means and may look for men who honor God. And Father, for those here who are not yet saved, I might as well have been speaking Russian about this topic today. I know that. But, but oh Lord, your gospel is plain. And I pray that for men or women, boys or girls here who are not yet truly drawn savingly to Christ, that today would be the day that you would do that. That they would begin this happy journey of being conformed to the image of our Savior who died and rose again, that we might be set free from sin and death and hell and the grave. We ask this of you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.